about specifically which of the six themes of the Community Sports for Wraparound Inventory you think this presentation would fall into. And it kind of gives the overview of the fact that wraparound requires support at the system and program level to be effective. Um, and that research has shown those 16 of the CSWI. Which one do you think we're talking about in this presentation? You know what I mean? Come on, throw it out there. I bet you can come up with something. Fiscal, you know, there is aspects of fiscal in this because uh, CANS data can be very directly related to the degree to which uh, we're having success at containing costs and spending our money effectively. Strengths. What's that? Strengths? Strength. Yes, strengths bases a value of a wraparound or philosophy or part of the, uh, the one of the principles of a wraparound. But which of the six community supports do you think that this is? Informal sports. Informal sports, again, that is a principle of a wraparound. Accountability. Accountability, right? So you got a lot of, there's a lot of ways in which data supports the wraparound process, and you guys are throwing out there some great uh, principles of wraparound. What we're talking about now is kind of moving from the global picture of support that we build for wraparound to one of the specific areas, which is accountability. Um, a few acknowledgments. The primary driver of this work is Dr. Uh, Jennifer Coldiron, who um, just had her second child and is not with us this year. Um, Spencer Hensley is her... Uh, right-hand man on this work, so to speak. And uh, I'm here setting, setting Spencer up to show you some preliminary data from our effort to try to compile data from uh, CANS implementing wraparound uh, states and sites across the country with some pretty interesting preliminary findings. So the setup here, so and other acknowledgments, this work is uh, partially funded by the, uh, we're, we're a core partner of the TA network uh, for children's behavioral health. And uh, which is funded by SAMHSA, Child, Adolescent, and Family Branch. And this is one of our uh, projects we're doing under the auspice of our, our task order there. And uh, again, as for all of these, um, as Janet explained at the beginning, all of this work is also under the auspice of, uh, you know, we're the wraparound evaluation <laughs> research team at the University of Washington, April Sather, Spencer, myself, Alyssa, and Hattie are in the back there, Ryan is here. Um, and what we're doing together is trying to support wraparound implementation on the ground in state and sites across the country. So one of the things that we want to do uh, as part of that is to learn and understand um, how states and sites are actually uh, supporting wraparound as, as a, and data is a huge piece of that, okay, and, and accountability. So as Janet was saying, like, you know, back in like 2004 or 2003, National Wraparound Initiative set out to try to um, uh, define and support high quality care coordination using the wraparound model. At the time there was uh, some beginnings of data and research on wraparound, but a lot of people concerned that it wasn't enough, it wasn't well enough defined. And as Re Janet was saying, we quickly realized that um, quality practice was going to be highly dependent uh, upon system conditions uh, and the organizations in which these wraparound care coordinators were embedded, right? Um, they're dependent on the systems, the organizations, the structures that surround the actual people uh, that are implementing the services. It's too bad uh, Dean left. Anyone else here from NERN, National Implementation Research Network? So Dean Fixon was back there. I'm sure they're curious about the CSWI. I wanted to at least give him a shout out. So, you know, our uh, work is, is predicated on implementation science. The idea that positive youth and family outcomes are going to be dependent on high quality, high fidelity services. And that those services are going to be really dependent, the quality and fidelity of those services are going to be dependent on things like leadership, organization and system drivers, and staff competency drivers, right? Uh, so certainly selection, training, coaching, but also uh, decision support, data systems, systems interventions, and so forth. Um, and not only that, but the, the as, as Janet was showing, the, our, you know, I should have known that you were going to show this slide, right? So I put it in there anyway. It, it, cannot be, it cannot be reinforced too many times. If you want effective wraparound teams for youth with the most complex needs in their families who need intensive care coordination, they need to be working within supportive organizations, and those organizations need to be in hospitable systems that reflect all the things that Janet was just describing we measure in the CSWI. And a big part of those hospitable systems are data systems. Now, we are, in fact, the Wraparound Evaluation Research Team. Not surprisingly, as the accountability partner of the National Wraparound Implementation Center, we're pretty much obsessed with data and outcomes and costs and fidelity and quality and making sure that wraparound implementing states and sites um, 
have a beat on all of those things. Um, the thing about you know two ways, real real com ways in which we stress the connection between system and program supports and wraparound implementation on the ground. One is training and coaching, right? So you saw that workforce development is one of the six themes of, of wraparound support. If you want high quality practice that families experience, you have to invest at a system level in high quality training, coaching, and supervision. That's data informed, <laughs> structured, gets people to some degree of kind of certification or recognition of their skill before they're put out there to, uh, Kim Copiello is nodding, she does that every day for the National Wraparound Implementation Center. Another big one is accountability, right? Research shows that at a practice level in human services, about half of all the variance and outcomes <coughs> may very well be accounted for by the degree to which the person who's helping you and you set goals that you agree on mutually and then track progress towards it. I mean, I'm getting pretty convinced in this field, uh, you know, after all the complex stuff we do, if you know what the needs are you're working on as a team on behalf of that family and wraparound, and you track progress towards it, you might get about halfway to as good of an outcome as you might be able to get. You know, a clear need statement and tracking progress. And then at a system or organizational level, what if you aggregate up those data and you have information about the degree to which all of your families are making progress, the, the outcomes that they're experiencing, whether their needs are being addressed, whether satisfaction is high. So you can then aggregate that data up at, a, at an organization or, a, or an agency level um, or a, pro, a project level, and that's what's going to keep you on track as a system or a system of care or a state. So accountability is huge. So what we're going to talk about today is I've already talked about, we've heard about the necessary sports <coughs> background. We're going to talk about the levels of decision support that standardized assessment by tools such as the CANs or other uh, instruments can provide and how important that is. And talk about something that we're calling the CANs Data Collection Project. We don't have a fancier name for it. Um, uh, where we're trying to get data from the CANs across all of the many uh, states and sites uh, that are using CANs in wraparound contexts. And what are some of the implications of what we're learning and what do we want to do going forward, right? And Spencer's going to talk about the data, and then we're going to ask you all to tell us what you think uh, the data mean, because we're still really trying to sort it out. Okay? So here's the setup for uh, Spencer talking about the results. Um, so how many folks here have ever administered, had administered to them, looked at CANS data, or working in a site that uses the CANS? So about two-thirds of the room hands go up, right? We're learning that as well. So for those of you who don't know the CANS, developed by Dr. John Lyon, supported by the Prade Foundation. Um, you can go to their website to learn more, uh, or John's Chapin Hall websites, I imagine. Um, it's, com it's composed of 40 to 50 uh, core items, divided into five or six domains. And the reason that it's, uh, the numbers here vary is, is that um, it can be customized for a state or a site uh, to meet their particular needs, child welfare context, behavioral health, and, and so forth. Um, and some sort of professional, and we'll learn that who the person is that administers the tool might actually have a lot to do with what you get out of it, it seems as though, and wrap around. Um, so the professional administers the tool based on their knowledge of the youth and family. Um, in many states, it's become kind of uh, an expectation that you'll do this at, um, at entry every three or six months thereafter. And needs are rated from zero, which means no evidence that this is a need that should be intervened with or that we need to, to be working on to three, which means immediate intensive action is needed. And then there are strengths uh, that are scored from zero, which means it's a centerpiece strength around which we should build supports and, 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 uh, and focus on that family, to uh, no strength identified. Perhaps this is an area in which we really need to try to help uh, build strengths for this for this youth and family. Okay? And this is a, an incredibly uh, thumbnail sketch of the CANs. Um, but um, what we do know is, is that CANs and wraparound um, are being implemented in nearly every state, right? So the blue states are states in which there's at least some wraparound and or some CANS administration, and the orange states, and they're growing every year, are the states in which we have statewide implementation of both the wraparound, uh, uh, the CANS and wraparound. Um, and the, the states with STARS are states where uh, the National Wraparound Implementation Center is actively doing training, coaching, and technical assistance. So you see a lot of overlap between the states that um, NWIC is working in and that uh, John and his team 
are uh, helping get the, uh, the cans um, used statewide. And so we have this opportunity to say, what is it that, well, I'll tell you what we're going to try and do, right? So, so points, the reason that this is the case is that there are so many points of connection between the cans and wrapper, and they both are intended to focus on the whole family, not just the identified child. We're trying to base planning on presence and needs and strengths rather than symptoms or deficits. They both aim to identify the issues that demand action. Uh, in wraparound uh, training and coaching we do, it's about needs, uh, but that's also the language of the cans. Or they could be leveraged into productive strategies in terms of strengths. Um, and both the cans and wraparound are really building on some of the same principles that we're going to inform our planning at a system, organization, and family or team level based on data. We're going to treat targets. So in other words, we're going to keep working until uh, the family's made progress towards needs. That's when we transition families out of formal wraparound and the idea of accountability. But it also is about promoting transparency. So, you know, John will talk about how important it is for the CANs to be something that all members of the team have access to so that, um, you know, you, you, you're actually rallying around an objective picture of the child or family in terms of what their profile of strengths and needs are. Same thing with wraparound. You have a team-based process where people are collectively uh, working with the child and family uh, in the driver's seat. Their preferences are prioritized, but the team has all got a common understanding of the family's path and how they got to services and what they need. Okay, so decision support that's promoted by CANS can be at multiple levels, like I'm saying, the family and youth, the program and system. Um, and, you know, just a real quick point about, you know, how we're trying to promote CANS use in all those sites and states, because it's not always that clear sometimes at the practice level. How do we reconcile a uh, wraparound <laughs> approach to uh, planning and implementation to uh, where the CANS fits into all this? And I think that there's a lot of opportunities um, this is really not about the data, but just kind of the, the practice level. Um, you know, CANS is often used for eligibility and authorization. You know, CANS data can be used to help the team uh, kind of identify with the family again, being those who have the, the greatest say in their own words, uh, what the immediate action items are. We can help, the, the CANS can be used to help engage the family, learn their story and so forth, but of course, that family narrative is really first and foremost coming from the family in wraparound. Um, the care coordinator can use the CANS data and team preparation to think about what kind of services and supports might be brought to the table in, in team preparation and in planning. Okay, so this is just a really fast overview of all the ways in which uh, CANS can be used to support wraparound practice as trained by National Wraparound Implementation Center. So as one basis for brainstorming services and supports for the plan of care, um, reviewed in team meetings as one way of monitoring progress towards meeting needs, achieving outcomes, uh, review the CANS data against the strategies in the plan of care to make sure that the right strategies and so forth. We really think that the family's perspective on whether they're making progress towards their own needs statements is the most important data that we collect and use in, in team-based planning, but the CANS can be something that also provides a real uh, comprehensive and hopefully objective view of that as well, so it can be another source of data uh, along the way. Okay, so let's get to the data. Um, we're to, that's at the family and youth level. What we're recognizing is, is that programs and systems also have the opportunity to have CANS data aggregated up to evaluate outcomes, look at you know, whether or not uh, to, to use it to support continuous quality improvement, program redesign perhaps, to do evaluation of their own success. But you know, there's a, big, a lot of questions about the CANS data. And when you start aggregating it up or looking at your data for a site or a state or a, a provider organization that's doing wraparound, um, oftentimes we hear people have these data, maybe they're very useful at a family level, but how do we use it at a program level? And so our job is to, what we're trying to do is to compile these data to try and get some understanding of things like, what are the typical strengths and, and needs of wraparound enrolled families? Can we help? design wraparound interventions and, and care coordination processes to be as responsive as possible to the typical needs and strengths of, of, of wraparound enrolled youth across the country. Right? So that's one reason we're pulling the data together. We could use these data to say, well, what services are needed in the service arrays in these uh, states or sites, um, particularly those that are using uh, care management entity models where you're trying to build service arrays to be responsive based on data to what the needs are of families and youth. This is a big one that just really interests me. What are benchmarks for trajectories of improvement in CANS over time? We have dozens of sites, 
you know, or hundreds of sites, dozens of states using the CAMS, what represents good improvement at six months or 12 months when all these states and sites are saying collected at baseline three, six, tw nine, 12 months? Do we know what a typical trajectory of improvement is for youth and families of different uh, profiles so that you could benchmark whether or not your site is doing well? Um, and what's the variation in CAMS profiles across states and sites in general? And what might drive differences? Because we, we, again, I don't think we know this well enough. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Spencer to talk about the data that we have compiled and what we've learned thus far. Thank you. Um, so I don't think, unfortunately, we're going to be able to answer any of these questions. <laughs> Gotta love Spencer. Keep me honest. <laughs> because this is still very, you know, this is a, a project that we're right in the middle of, and this data is very preliminary, but we do have some interesting pieces of information related to all of these. Um, so, so far we have data from five states. Um, matched baseline six-month assessments, we have a little shy of 3,000 youth. Um, the majority of them are male, the majority of them are white. They're an average of about 12 years old. Um, our, we sort of made our own little assessment windows, so something is a six-month assessment as long as it's within 45 days on either side of that. So there is some variation in the amount of services that these youth and families are actually getting um, at each assessment time point. And then, although the, the tool is organized around a bunch of domains, as Eric mentioned, because there are differences from state to state in what items are in what domains, um, not all states even use every item, we're not going to talk about domain scores, certainly nothing like a total score today. It's just going to be item level results. Okay. So here we have the 10 most prevalent strengths for our 3,000 families. Um, just sort of in order, at baseline in that six months. So a small subset of items are, are categorized as strengths. They can be strengths of the caregiver or strengths of the youth. Um, we see that those top three there, that's actually caregiver involvement with care, that's caregiver access to services, and that's the caregiver's level of organization, organization at home, organization with services. And we can see that between 70 up to maybe 90% of families in our data set, that's a strength that family has. Um, those, maybe because of kind of the ceiling effect, are staying fairly similar. But thereafter, we see all of our strengths going up at six months. More families are exhibiting these strengths after around six months of services. And we're somewhere around that sort of 50% range. So about half of these families, or each of these strengths is exhibited in about half of our families. The bulk of the items, though, are categorized as needs. So here we have top 10 needs in our data set for these five states in order. We see a lot of emotional and behavioral <laughs> needs, impulsivity, anger control, um, oppositional behavior, social functioning. Um, all of, you know, fewer youth exhibit these needs at six months, but you'll notice that for these top 10, even after six months, over half the majority of youth exhibit each of these needs. Or each of these needs is exhibited by over half of the youth. So if we pick just the top five there, just those first five, and take a look at what change starts to actually look like, we can see here on the very left-hand side, that's the percent of youth for whom it was a new need at six months. They didn't see it at baseline, but six months later, they said, this is really a need we should work on. About 55 to 65% at beige color in the middle that's the continuity of a need. That's a need they had at baseline. It was still a need six months later. For about 15% of youth, over the course of six months, that need gets met. It was rated as a two or three. Six months later, it was rated as a zero or one. And then, and then for the remaining 15 or 20%, um, those are just kids for whom it was never a need, and, and they're still doing fine. Um, but we can so. This is a little bit larger than that. About 10 to 20 percent of youth get at least one need met within those first six months. Of course, that means that around 80, 85 percent of youth are having any needs met, at least according to the CAMS, within the first six months of wraparound services. Um, around 10 percent will have a newly identified need at six months as well. So now we're going to look for some demographic differences. So before we were seeing the percent of families that exhibited each of those things, this is actually an average score. 
So over on the left, that's no evidence of a need. Over on the right, that's a, you know, an intense, actionable need. These are, again, just our top five. We can see that there are males are significantly have, have, have significantly more severe needs at baseline than women do. Younger youth have significantly more needs at baseline than older youth. Um, just, there's age categories there. You can see that white youth actually have more severe needs in our data set than do either black youth or youth that are multiracial or some other race category. So um, those are all fascinating, but the next slides I'm gonna show you are differences by the state who's administering the cans. Um, although we have five states so far, I'm just gonna show you three. These are our three biggest states that each have 700 to 1,000 or so cases. Um, we've done some very preliminary, sort of hastily done regression analyses. They seem to indicate um, that much more of the variance is explained by state, and that's gonna not surprise you when you see the next slide. So here are our three states, and these are again our average scores. And really, it's whether or not this, um, whether or not the CANS was administered in this middle state, what I'm calling state B, um, that is a strong predictor of the score, of the score of that U, the severity of that U, for that U. Now it could be, so these are, these are strengths. So it could be that state B maybe gives just more extreme responses. They think that the needs are more severe and the strengths are stronger. But that's not actually the case. In this state, they really just rate everything sort of more so in the same direction. So the strengths are actually weaker and the needs are more severe. We're not totally sure why this is happening at this point. It is still you know, a work in progress. We have some ideas. So it could be that there are differences in the populations in these places. In states A and C, so those are the, the two that weren't the long one, um, we have data from everybody receiving wraparound for any reason. In state B, we only have data from youth from one particular funding stream. It's a big one, it's a lot of youth, but it isn't everybody. Um, data from states A and C are, are more recent, it's from 2014 and 2015, whereas in state B, it's older data, 2008 to 2012. And then maybe most interestingly, there are some differences in terms of the way the CANS is actually administered in these states. So in states A and C, the ones where the scores are a little bit lower, external folks are responsible for administering those assessments. Um, in both states at baseline, and one of them at least at, at every reassessment as well. In state B, it's actually wraparound staff and, and often the facilitator herself who's administering that CANS. So there may be a different perspective or different kind of incentives that go into um, the administration process. Eric, you want to talk a little bit about implications? Well, let's talk about it together. Sure. And not just the two of us, all of you. So we've got eight or nine minutes before we say what we think we're seeing here. Um, what do you think? They, they, you know, they, they suggest to us that we don't want to just necessarily swallow any standardized assessment process whole. You need to be looking at your own data at a system or state level to analyze these kinds of things. What is varying from you to other states that are using the CANS, which is kind of part of our purpose here, is to be able to have those data available for folks to do that benchmarking or to compare yourself to other states of different types. We're at the very beginning process. But analyze yourself as a state or site and what your uh, profiles look like. Um, analyze uh, yourself within your state or site to look at things like differences by race or ethnicity, difference by raters if there are different types of raters, different by per difference by purpose. It could be that the CANS is used for eligibility determination and it's administered by one type of person, then it's used at a team level by another type of person. What are the differences for the same families by raters of the same family or the same types of families across time? So the big question is just, do you have the capacity to look at your own data, whether it's CANS or anything else, to ask these questions. Are the algorithms driving anything about the, the, um, the data you're getting? Um, there's a huge implication here. Go back to the racial and ethnic differences. You know, John Lyons, and, and we looked at this, and before we even analyzed the data, we were working on another project to say, what are the things that should determine eligibility for wraparound or intensive services? 
Is it past placement or past system involvement that is very predictive of future system involvement? So you'd say, well, the data suggests that if you want to reduce future costs and future out-of-home placements, look at the families who had past out-of-home placements. And John says, well, the reason we use the CANs is, is that that's just basically saying systems that, as we heard this morning by our plenary speaker, that are inherently biased, um, policies and, and practices in our own system that lead to dis uh, disparities in outcomes, or what we're going to base our planning on for the family, no, we should be doing it based on the profile of this family's strengths and needs. But what's really interesting is, then we see these differences by race and ethnicity. Is this a reflection of exactly what John was saying and what you know our speaker today was saying, that um, it could be that our uh, families and youth that are being served in our most intensive programs um, actually are quite different depending on the color of their skin? You know, and it's being and it's coming playing out in terms of this objective analysis, obje objective assessment of their strengths and needs. Or is there something else going on here? It's a very interesting question, and I'd is be there, curious what others may. Sorry, thinking. is there a disproportionate number of white kids in that B state? Yeah. Because I that would really skew what the race looks like. Um, what is the demographic? Right. right. So it'd be exactly. for a second. Yeah. Um, states A and. C a and B have really similar demographics. Right? Yeah. Or, I mean, A and B have really similar demographics. We don't think that it's the demographic. We don't think that these state differences are driving that picture of the differences within children. So it's something to be looking at, I think, within your state and for us to be looking at continue, as we continue to compile these data. Go ahead to the last uh, implications there, because we're almost out of time. Um, I can go back one more quick. So, you know, we, we suggest that those who are using CANs, and a lot of you raised your hand, make sure you're looking at your own data and asking these questions, because we're, we're going to look at it at a national level and try and keep putting the data out there. Hopefully, we'll start to get some more definitive kinds of uh, answers, or at least uh, things that can drive hypotheses that you can test at a local level. Um, but this, this next bullet, you know, monitor and foster data integrity. Again, regardless of whether it's CANs or any other standardized assessment, you know, it seems as though, and I think, how many people here believe that who's administering the CANs probably has a big impact on what the scores are, or the purpose? Okay, right. And that's going to be the case for any standardized assessment. So it's playing out in the CANs as it would for any other measure, the CAFIS or the CBCL or the CASI or the Colocus. We suggest you make sure you're taking a hard look at your data and, you know, what some of these implications might be for your system. Um, and then that last bullet is, you know, make sure you actually are taking advantage of the data. How many folks here are collecting CANS data and you wonder whether it's being used in all those decision support ways that it could be used? You know, is anyone ever <coughs> concerned about the degree, whether it's CANS or standardized ass assessment of other, you know, some, some hands go up, some brave souls say, yeah, we're collecting data, maybe we're not actually using it. Maybe some people feel like it's busy work. Let's make sure that doesn't happen, right? Go to the, the next slide. So here's what we're going to try and do is to, is to try and get a little bit better picture of the degree to which benchmarks might be established for CANS improvement, for profiles of, uh, of needs across states that might be appropriate for wraparound eligibility. But as you can see, it's complicated. And it may very well be that we have to establish different benchmarks depending on how you're using the tool or who's, who's reading it. But we're going to strive to try and do our best to see if that's possible and ask questions like, what accounts for the most variance in scores at baseline? Um, what accounts for the most change that you see over six, 12, or more months? What predicts change over time? And can we, as so many people have strived to do out in our field, use CANS data to, in combination with family and youth uh, uh, you know, perspectives and, and uh, preferences and stories, to help provide us information about connecting them to the right size to help, the right kind of help? Um, without it feeling like it's a, uh, a kind of technocratic process of just saying, um, here's your CAN scores and here's your plan now. There's got to be a way in which these data can be used as, along with a full fidelity wraparound process that's engaging the youth and family and puts them in the driver's seat. That's our thing. So, maybe one last question or comment and then we'll move on to that. <laughs> I was just going to say that the, the mm -hmm. rater who's filling out the CANs may be less important if the CANs mm -hmm. is filled out.